when we were cleaning out George's place, we found a cardboard box. Yes. With a plastic bag around it in a set of old metal shelves in the pump room between the garage and the house. If that, it's called the mud room besides. So, yeah. so you open the box and there's paper envelopes with negatives in them, four by four negatives. And you hold the negative up to the light and it, the negatives are of the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge from the mud road, zero, no thing, mud road, guys in diving bells. There's wow. a picture of a man in diving bell about to set the foundation. There's pictures of the Sausalito Tower up, but the San Francisco side not up. Wow. And I get goosebumps talking about them. And I don't know, it was a couple thousand dollars, but it is the only place in Portland that will digitize film negatives. And the lady said, it's gonna be expensive. And I said, you just take a look at them and you'll find out why it's worthwhile. And she sent me the first one and was just like, it's such a privilege to even touch these. No kidding. They're so stunning. So that what, was- What an intro. <laughs> you're the one that's in charge of themes but when you think about foundations and impossible things the golden gate bridge was built in three years three years okay. the largest suspension bridge in the world longest And it started because of one person's idea and they were in Georgia's. So there's this idea in Georgia's head. We had that list of frequencies from Harry and that blue box in room two. It's got two channels and Harry's old machine has two channels. I wonder if the frequencies would work. This is 1995, early 95. And it, is that almost 30 years ago? 25 and 8 is 13, 28 years ago. Easily, yeah, easily. So he says that, and I only work Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So Tuesday and Thursday in the morning, we start treating my most difficult patients with sticky pads on their back and George figuring out, translating Harry's ideas and his ideas to the patient that's on the table. And I'm the one with the license. So I've got my hands on the patient. When you think about the foundations of what we do and how it's evolved since then, it's been extraordinary. This week in Philadelphia was, once again, 20% of the class had Ehlers-Danlos and a slightly overlapping subset had vestibular injuries. Some that they knew about, some that they didn't know about. Okay. Some Ehlers Danlos patients seem to have vestibular injuries because the connective tissue in the endolymphatic sac is as stretchy as everything else on them. So there's this one girl, and she and her mom came to the seminar. Mom's a nurse practitioner. The girl, I think, was how old, Kevin? 20, 23 or so, <laughs> body pain of a six or a seven, but that's normal for her. And then, yeah, her thumb touches her arm. Isn't It's always been that way. And my elbow goes backwards and I went, uh-huh. 
and this and that. So we treated her for other stand loss and she had a vestibular injury. So we did that whole protocol. And for the people who are listening that I haven't checked in with, oh, no hands, no Q&A, yay. Anyway, so you do torn and broken in 77, the connective tissue from neck to feet, and then 40 and 10 to take care of the body pain. So I had 20 some odd people in this class and they get to watch this. 40 and 10 takes her body pain down. But then I felt her legs and the tone in her adductors and her quads and her hamstrings was just painful. So we did 81 and 10, which is increased descending inhibition in our world. And came the inevitable question, how can you quiet ascending pain transmission and increase descending inhibition at the same time? And it was wonderful. I got to say, I have no idea. I know it works because I've done it, I don't know, 400 times. So I know you can do them together. And then her range of motion in her knees went to normal. Her elbows went to normal. Her little finger and her thumb were the hardest, most difficult. And then she had eight of the nine Baton score things, but she couldn't touch her hands to the floor. She said, oh yeah, my hamstrings are always tight. So we got the tone on her legs down and I brought her knee up towards her chest yeah. and it stopped at 90 degrees. Oh, okay. So we treated scarring in the dura and pretty soon her knee goes to her chest. Anyway, it was miraculous. So by the fifth day, on the fourth day, I said, look, your thumb and your little finger are just difficult. So put a contact around your neck and hold a washcloth in each hand and sit there and listen to the lecture for two hours running torn and broken in the connective tissue. Okay. When was the last day? Last day was Sunday. She comes up to me and goes, look. And I have a picture of her thumb stopping an inch and a half before her forearm. And I have a picture of her little finger at 70 degrees. So that was my week. Who would have thought there would be so many hidden Ellers downless patients and coming to the FSM seminars? And her mom has Ehlers downless too. Wow. But by the time you get to be in your 50s, the Ehlers Danlos goes from being Ehlers Danlos to being HSD, historic hypermobility syndrome disorder. So as you get older, the joints get stiffer and you have Ehlers Danlos historically, but now because your joints are funky, your elbow does stop at zero, but your skin is more stretchy and you make some of the criteria, but HSD, historic hypermobility syndrome. The criteria are dislocations, sprains, different kinds of historic injuries, plus the hypermobile joints you have left. So mom was ecstatic. She was ecstatic. One of the practitioners was an army major who, have you ever heard the phrase dirt dart? No. I hadn't either. A dirt dart is what happens when you're jumping out of a plane and your parachute circumstances are such that you hit the ground not the right way and you just
as it happened, she landed on her sacrum instead of landing on her feet and rolling. Oh, dear. Yeah. So that's when I found out we had two osteopaths and an MD in the class. And the one of the osteopaths, as I'm working on her, trying to get her dura unstuck after this trauma, he said, the dura attaches at S2. Get out. It attaches along the sacrum and the coccyx. And he said, no, it has a thing that attaches to S2. And I went, okay, so 13 scarring in the dura is not getting it done. So what is the dura scarred to? It's scarred down to the periosteum. Okay. So we did scarring in the periosteum and it, her knee went from, I don't know, maybe 100 to 130 and her pelvis just went smush. And then he said, not only does it attach at the foramen magnum, it attaches C2. Did you know that? No, I don't think I did. I didn't know that. Yeah. There are many more stories, but I'm, it's after a five day seminar, it's really hard for me to just not purge all the things that you this is the thing about coming to a seminar is there's this continuing education that is unavoidable because every patient teaches you something a little bit different or allows you to think about something in a slightly different way, which is the game changer. Total. And every patient is different. Yeah. And because the class, we had PTs, one massage therapist, acupuncturist, one MD, two osteopaths, four nurse practitioners, two nurses. It was a really broad scope class. Yeah. And people knew things. For example, because 20% of the class had vestibular injuries, they're working on, I can't remember who, and her neck muscles just won't let go. As we're doing, we do the supine cervical practicum three times until everybody gets it done. Yeah. And on that patient, I said, do me a favor, just run 40 and 44. Quiet the activity of 44 is the inner ear. Mm -hmm. It's a vestibular system. Run 40 and 44 in somebody with a vestibular injury. And the whole neck just goes smoosh. Wow. Especially the suboccipitals. Sure. The neck muscles tighten up like crazy to provide proprioception to the brain about where it is in space. Yeah. And you quiet the inner ear, get the neck muscles to relax, and then you can find out what's going on mechanically. Oh, and there were chiropractors too. That was really fun. It was good group. Yeah. And they're all really excited that you're coming to Portland. I'm so excited. I think we still have a little bit of space left. We're going to cap it at a small group because it's small, but. Oh, hang on one second. Did you talk to that guy about the other space? I was only going to if it looked like we were going to need it. She, so we'll far. talk after about logistics. <laughs> there numbers. is this gorgeous room. It's completely empty. They haven't been able to rent it. So we were thinking if we got past the, I don't know, 12 or 16 that we can put in room two, yeah. maybe we can rent that big empty room with the big vaulted ceiling and all the windows. Oh, cool. Yeah. And there's, a, that, that could work. What I have learned as a instructor is that we as a people are procrastinators. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Especially if you're signing up for continuing education classes. Like people will take time off of work. They'll book their plane tickets. They'll book their hotel tickets. They'll book the kennel for the dog. 
but they'll register like the day before. So people like us are losing our minds. And this has been true since 2003 when we started using hotels. Staff is panicking for two weeks because it's like, are we going to do it or aren't we? Yeah. And then in that two weeks, the class goes from six to 35. Yeah. <laughs> it's a true story. It is. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm super excited. I'm playing with the slides once again because it's a thing. Does everybody go through that before they present the same material, like changing the course all the time? Oh, every time. I do. Kevin. No, I know. I maybe I have I'm not making eye contact with Kevin, but I got to the end of the neuropathic pain section and there's fibromyalgia. And I said, that doesn't make any sense. We need to go from neuropathic pain to the central nervous system. So I changed the order I presented it in. And then yesterday I got an email from a patient who's also a practitioner. And she said, hey, you told me you'd send me the slides, the new slides for the five day. And I'm like, okay. But then I completely rearranged the deck. So now we do nerve pain, central nervous system, fibromyalgia. I put the quiz in different places every time. Because every time you teach it, you find out where it gets sticky. Right. This shouldn't be so hard to understand. And the sports course, I the modules are rehab, recovery, performance enhancement. And those have to go in that order because you can't recover from something that you have not re rehabilitated from. And you're not going to improve your performance enhancement if you're not recovering. And they you all gotta, each other. You got to recover first before you can rehabilitate it. Y yes and no. So in the athletic population, recovery is what's happening after the fact. So how are they recovering after training? How are they recovering oh. after your treatment with them? It's a different so, way of using the word recovery. Exactly. Yes. But yes, like I just said, they all lead into each other. And as you teach it and you get the questions, I'm like, you're totally right, but I can't move it because you have to learn this before you can learn this. Yeah. So, so for today, <laughs> this is before this, but then when you go to your clinic, you do it all together. <laughs> I, that's exactly it. You know, I was on a podcast this morning. I was a guest, which was super interesting. And Ooh. somebody was talking about their Achilles tendinopathy and how a certain frequencies hadn't been able to fully resolve it. And I said, yeah, you had a really good start because you're running all the scarring frequencies, but what happened before it scarred? Like, oh, I love this. <laughs> oh, it tore. And then what around it tore? And could it, that have bled? And it was like, you learned the right frequencies, but we just didn't have this little nugget of how did it get there? Yeah. Let's rewind the tape a little bit more and yeah. the tape a little bit more. And figure out that even though it feels repaired in yeah. athletes, it's challenging because their pain threshold is so high. Yeah. And so what if the Achilles hadn't completely recovered, hadn't completely repaired itself? Okay, yeah. So you have to finish repairing the connective tissue. Oh, yeah. And there's absolutely no way to get even a partial thickness Achilles tear without messing with the periosteum, which is covered with freer nerve endings. So you want to do torn and broken in the periosteum and then the periosteum after it gets torn and broken gets inflamed and then it gets scarred but you can't treat the scarring until after you do the repair and to watch the look on their face as they get it yeah it's just fascinating it is and <laughs> 
for me now too, it is looking at the mechanical properties of what's happening, but having more of a profound respect for the emotional components that happen with the injury. And I admit it every time I teach, I didn't believe in the emotional frequencies Mm -hmm. when I first started. It, Mm -hmm. It was something that And the age I was at also, it's just with age comes wisdom and experience and appreciation for different things. And so many of the athletes grow up in this environment where they have to compartmentalize everything. They wouldn't possibly get to the level of being a pro and Olympian if you stopped and reacted to every sad or off day that you had, because they had to learn how to blow through the stop signs and certain practitioners. We end up blowing through the stop signs because we have busy practices. We have mortgages to pay. It's the money that drives us, the ego that drives us. And the time. And the time. TikTok. Totally. And I feel for the therapists and trainers that come to my sports course that are employed by professional sports teams, because they don't have two hours and four machines the way I can, if I need to. Oh, I think what keeps me up at night is trying to get those practitioners more efficient with the frequencies when you don't have that much time. Yes person in the white you can raise your hand yes. <laughs> when I was with the Eagles yeah and they had the head trainer and three assistants yeah and after I treated Terrell the team ordered 30 custom cares yeah like 30 Now, teaching, you've gone the step further and insisted. I was too new. In 2005, I didn't have the power that you've got. They weren't too sure how to use them. Yeah. But each trainer could have two units on, because. big athletic team it's not like you're in cubby holes like we are in practice right it's all 25 guys in a great big room and six or eight treatment tables and trainers and ice and tape and heat and machines and going from table to where there's motivation there's possibility yes other thing is that once they start to notice especially the way you've done it with this these last two teams that you brought on once they start to notice that their guys recover faster than the other team and they recover faster than they did last year when they got injured. And they recover faster than the guys who aren't being treated with FSM. And in professional sports, as in private practice, time is money. Yeah. If I can use five machines and get a patient functional in five visits, treating five things at one time, I save them money. I save me time. Pardon me for interrupting. I'll put my hand down now. (laughs) No, your comments are absolutely right. And where the piece that I've really gravitated towards is teaching. Is being the storyteller and being the troubleshooter. And that's why when I do these private team courses, Part of the fee is you get my cell phone number because 
I want to help you. I don't care if it's midnight and I'm sleeping. I want to help you try to walk through what it is so you could build this program for this patient. I don't want it to be a plug and play, push and go thing. And it's been so cool to get screenshots of what they've made in their mode bank for certain players. And every sport's a little bit different. An acute injury is going to be an acute injury. And it's just been, it's been so cool to see the thinking that's going on, not just the result, like being part of that process. The light bulbs. Yeah. That is the thing I love about teaching is watching the light bulbs and finish that course, that slide that we finish every course on, changing patients' lives one practitioner at a time and changing even one patient's life can change the world. Yeah. And watching them get it over five days. Yeah. And knowing for sure if Sunday night at seven o'clock was the last thing I ever did on this planet. We got hit by an asteroid and everybody was gone. To have done that, or let's say just the asteroid hit me and these 30 people go out and what are they going to do? Especially now that we figured out that we're teaching them is how to think about injury I I would say injury, recovery, rehabilitation, and performance. Yeah. Think about it from new injury to putting it all together by integrating the nervous system and from the brain, from the sensory cortex to your gastroc. Excuse me? That's that. And watching their eyes light up when they get it. Yes. It's It's funny because new injury is the first thing that we talk about in the sports course, as opposed to chronic, we put chronic injury later. And I'm like, this is the easiest stuff that you're ever going to treat. this is a slam dunk, like getting your hands on a fresh injury or somebody who's destroyed themselves in the weight room and patching them up so that they don't feel a thing the next day. So they can train just as hard and not miss a beat. That's just like the easiest of the easy. All you have to do is stop the bleeding, turn down the inflammation, increase secretions and treat treat torn and broken and increase secretions. And do you know what's actually changed in the last, especially year for that is the inflammatory part because we, and this is going to make certain people's hair set on fire the minute I say that, but we do need a certain amount of inflammation. And I think we get really caught up with that word. And I went on a riff at the advance because, oh, everyone's going to, I'm so inflamed. This is so inflamed. I have inflammation. I'm like, okay, relax can you even define inflammation? Like probably not, but I feel like we're using that word almost like frozen shoulder. And do you know what I mean? It's like this. People put an equal sign between inflammation and pain and not all pain is inflammatory. No. So Achilles tendonitis actually isn't an itis because the immune system isn't involved. Diana Cross It was her first lecture that just blew my hair back, speaking of which. Yeah. And it is that when you tear a tendon, let's say the Achilles, you have a partial thickness tear in the Achilles and the tennis site, the tendon cell body that lives about that far above the calcaneus 
and then in these long connective tissue attachments or extensions from the cell body. When the tendon cell body feels, senses an injury to the connective tissue in the tendon, that signals a change. It's called damage associated molecular patterns, DAMPS, that hits the cell receptor in the tenocyte that changes the kinases and that changes the DNA and that changes the messenger RNA and that changes the micro RNA and what the tendon cell body begins to produce is interleukin-6, CGRP and substance P. Substance P is it's made by the cell. It's not an immune system reaction. You can have nerve pain with absolutely no inflammation any place except up at C5-6. So my thumb hurts. My thumb is really inflamed. No, the disc in your neck might be inflamed. Oh. It, it, it's not an equal sign. And the nice thing about FSM, as opposed to, let's say, the um, biological drugs that they use in autoimmune disease, the biological drugs take inflammatory cytokines down below normal and keep them there two and a half, three months until the next infusion. FSM takes the inflammatory cytokines and the prostaglandins down to the normal level or the mid-range of the normal level for four to six hours. And then the inflammation comes back. But because we've increased ATP by five times and because we've treated trauma and torn and broken and we stop the bleeding, that's the number one thing in a new injury is stop the bleeding. Yeah. And then we drop the inflammation with a hammer for four hours. Then it gets to come back and it goes, but wait. It's not as bad as I thought it was. Okay, I'll be a little inflamed. And say they feel better. That is a whole other way of looking at it that I didn't even think about explaining. Because again, going back to inflammation in an athletic population, when we talk about recovery, I'll go back to, again, using semantics here with this word. When you have an athlete that let's just say is a marathon runner and goes for a 10 mile run and comes back and their legs are full and hot and they want to do something for recovery. So the big things right now are like these Norma Tech boots that have compression in them. They're jumping into ice baths, right? So now I can say that's a good face. And I have the paper on my slides for the sports course, but if you Google, ice baths, not useful in recovery, you'll see a plethora of information right now showing that when you rob the body of inflammation right after activity, it's not going to recover and recover those macrophages going in your body's natural cleanup crew that's going in, cleaning up all the debris and is going to put it back into circulation again. If you put ice or cool the body down, you're not going to get that influx. But people think they're recovering because they're not getting hot and they're, they don't feel as inflamed, but you're robbing your body of the natural. Circulation. <laughs> it, it right. The blood vessels. Exactly. And when you look at the delayed onset muscle soreness protocol. Yes. The DOMS protocol. Yes. That prevents soreness after exercise. But the first thing we run for four minutes is to stop hemorrhage. And then it's torn and broken. And I think the last thing we run, but it's only for two minutes, it's 50% of the time. So if people are big mice, inflammation, the full effect is present at four minutes, half of the effect is present at two minutes. 
and we run reduce inflammation in very specific tissues for two minutes at a time at the very end, and then we run vitality. But the first thing is stop the bleeding because when you overuse a tissue, it's gonna bleed. That's what delayed onset muscle soreness is about. That's why it's worse two days later and then torn and broken. And at the very end, you just kind of do a little drive-by to reduce the inflammation. And the p-value with 20 patients, there, have, there has to be some statistician listening. To have a p-value of 0 0.005 with an n of 22 is insane. Right. Because of the way the math works, the fewer people, the harder it is to get a p-value with two zeros and a five. So Dom's is your friend. Totally. The other point I want to make with all of this is that even with a sprained ankle, and not just like with the dog, yeah. but even yeah. with a sprained ankle, we're seeing like stop throwing the ice on that area. Again, your body is going. Don't get inflamed right away. There's other tools that you can use to help that inflammation get out of control. And I think FSM is fantastic for that. We have some questions coming in. So let's address some of those. Some hellos. Yes. Hello. Hi, Leif. Hi. Yes, you're right. They should be able to afford all the machines. You're right. With when players pay a player six million dollars, you should be able to afford a couple of thousand dollars of devices. Right. Yes. Where did I have the question here? With respect, substance P is inflammatory. Oh. Okay. Okay. I'll look it up. The challenge is that when inflammation goes up. Pain goes up and mind you, substance P I heard about and studied 22 years ago and it's in the spinal cord and it conveys pain. So how do you separate it? If you have inflammation in the periosteum, you're going to have pain. Those nociceptive signals will go to the spinal cord and substance P will be produced in the spinal cord. Each cell that's inflamed, once it becomes inflamed, the DNA, the nucleus of the cell, produces messenger RNA, which produces microRNA, which produces the cellular response to whatever the signaling was. So Alpha, I want you to go back and look at the methods section. I'll look at the references. Anytime you read a paper, don't look at the headline. Don't even look at the abstract. You can scan the abstract, but just between you and me, we look at the methods section, see what they did, and then you look at the data and then you look at the conclusions. And what I found designing studies and reading hundreds of papers is you can produce almost any outcome you want in the method section. For example, one of my pet peeves is Ambien. It's a sleep medication. I change time zones twice a month. I've been on Ambien since 2000. One at night to sleep. I'm habituated. It's not addictive. My need has never increased. End of story. Doesn't have any side effects. I'm all good. So I go to a new GP and he gets all in my face about you shouldn't be taking that 
because it, people your age, it makes you fall. No, doesn't affect my balance at all. No, there's papers published. And then we get letters from Blue Cross. You shouldn't be taking Ambien. So I went back and looked at the original paper. There's the abstract that says, Ambien makes hospitalized patients over the age of 70 fall. Hmm. So then you look at the methods section. They don't tell you that the half-life of Ambien is four hours. So half of it is out of your system and you can function pretty normally four hours after you take it. You know what the methods of the paper was? Number one, hospitalized patients over the age of 70 with no exclusionary criteria listed in the method section, except for fractures in the leg. Okay, I can see the face. So they gave them 10 milligrams of Ambien, let them go to sleep, woke them up two hours later and had them walk on a four inch wide beam at, I don't know, midnight, two o'clock in the morning. So they give them the pill at 10, wake them up at midnight, they walk in the beam, they fall. Oh, then I looked at the authors. So there's a the method section, there's a conclusion, duh. Then I look at the authors. The primary investigator had his name. So I Googled him and what his previous papers were. His previous paper was written for, what's the antidepressant they use for sleep? Didn't come to me. Anyway, his previous paper was written for the drug that is the major competitor to Ambien. Okay. Little conflict of interest. A little bit. And then the second paper about Ambien was written by probably graduate students or residents because it was exactly the same method section, but this primary author wasn't in it. Same methods, see, same conclusion, duh. So when you read a paper, and this goes to even our papers, you look at the method section when don't look at the headlines right so when david simons read the cytokine paper it was like doing a thesis defense he had little teeny spidery handwriting and all the margins and little sticky notes every paragraph Why'd you do this? How'd you do that? Goes to the method section. Okay, got that. And gets the results. And then he gets to the conclusions. And he just stopped. David had written at that point about 243 peer-reviewed indexed and abstract papers starting in the late 1990s. So he gets to the conclusions and he goes, you understated your results. And I went, how did you figure that out? It's right here in the data and the methods. And then you understated it. Nobody does that. They always take the data and make it bigger than it is. And I said, if I said what we could actually do, not even Leon Chaito would publish it. Oh, okay, that's fair. When you read the paper. That's, an in, that's yeah, outright great example of faulty articles. We're in this like insta-quick society time period where we are, we're reading headlines and we're reading like the last line of the conclusion. Yeah. Nothing in between. And especially with published articles in a world where there are agendas about either medication 
or treatment processes. Yeah. You have to dig deeper in the paper and then you pick one paper and then you go searching for another paper or the paper that preceded that one or you look at the primary author and you look at the last paper that he wrote. And it takes the better portion of a Saturday afternoon, but if you live in Portland and you're rain, it's raining outside, what else are you going to do? Right. And what a great rabbit hole to go down, I think. It's anytime you can learn and learn from something, I think that's never time wasted. Yeah. Hi. How did we just talk for 45 minutes? And I feel like I'm just coming up for air right now. I don't know. Me too. We went on two different riffs, you with the Elders Downless course, me with the inflammation and the sports course and all the things. And we all come back together to this wonderful place that we're at right now. And the wonderful thing that we have that makes us special, I don't mind my saying so. Yes. Is we have a way to change the game. I love your t-shirts that say change the game. Yeah. With an Ehlers Danlos patient, because the Ehlers Danlos patients that are in the class say, How is it that I am 30 and I've had all these injuries and nobody ever checked? It's like they don't have a way to treat it. Yeah. So, why would they even look for it? So because we can treat it, we look for it. Same thing with vestibular injuries. Yeah. Because 94 and 94 makes them dizzy. We have an excuse to learn about vestibular injuries. Exactly. What you're looking at. There was a question that just popped up and I don't know where it went. Uh, it was in the chat and it went away. Yeah. I, I saw it. That's I what I thought. Okay. Kevin got it. Okay. Oh, you didn't get it? No, it's not his fault. Okay, maybe it'll come on again because something something popped and I wanted to make sure that we got it. But so when we started today, yes, 46 minutes ago, what was your original plan? Did well, you have a plan? I always have a plan. I know. But the theme, you're going to laugh at this. The theme is that nothing is linear. And we ended up talking about trying to make <laughs> plans and organize things, and you can't. <laughs> so I contradicted myself. But, and I want to tell you a little bit of what, why this theme was nothing is linear is because I had the privilege, and I'm still in awe that I was able to sit down with John Sharkey for an hour and I interviewed him on my- He did not. He did. When did you interview Sharkey? I, it was like 6 a.m. my time. So I could get sure. in Ireland at his- Oh my God. I and just... it was so funny because I was planning out who I wanted to have on my Game Changers podcast because I started with seven big dogs in sports performance. And how do I, who do I know that I can keep putting out these big people? And I made a list of all the people that I greatly admire their work. And of course, John Sharkey is up there and I don't always agree with what he says, but I love the man's passion. And I, I always learn something talking to him. Every time. I thought, what's it going to hurt by just asking? Uh, yeah. And he replied instantly, I'd love to. How about this day? Like, I will get up at any time to make this happen. Oh, my God. So what did he say? What'd you do? Tell me, tell me. Oh, you'll have to just wait till it's out. I don't, again, it, the podcast just had a mushroom cloud of information, and it went in all different directions, such as Tensegrity does, when everything is everywhere, and everything is intertwined, and nothing is linear. And everything is connected to everything. Yes. And the only missing piece between John Sharkey and me is fascia is enervated. 
and he doesn't get it because he has no way of manipulating the nervous system that connects the brain to the fascia. He can do it manually, right? Yeah. By connecting, by doing mechanical things. Yes. Panel induction to create current magnetic fields in the fascia that will eventually go up to the brain. But to demonstrate to John that what 13 and 142 scarring in the fascia and then 81 and the fascia and 81 and the cerebellum. Yeah. What that does to the fascia. Yeah. I have yet to be able to nail his little shoes to his shoes to the floor and get him to put his hands on a patient while we do that. Really? But lucky you, I swear to God, I would buy a plane ticket and go to Ireland just to have lunch with him. It's so fun. I know. And like I said, I thought, what's it going to hurt? But he said something so mind bending. And it was like, if fascia is everywhere and how could it be somewhere if it's everywhere? It was something like that. And I was just say that again. It was something along the line. I have to play it back. If fascia is everywhere, how can it be somewhere? because it's everywhere. So it's, it's talking about how it is everywhere. And the name of my podcast is game changers. Of course, right. we're changing the game. Yes. So that will be up probably in the next couple of days. Cause I have a person that edits it and does all yeah. the things, but there is controversy with the 10 segregated people because they never want to use the word stretch. Please God. No, because yeah. they just, They just see everything as, and they don't believe in torque. And for somebody like me, who is so biomechanically indoctrined to think that there are no levers anymore. Of course, there have to. Okay. In two things can be simultaneously true. There is absolutely, even though the fascia goes from the toes to the forehead and into the gut and creates the pericardium and covers everything and connects everything with everything. That is true. I get that. But there is no way to deny that the femur is a lever. That's physics. Right. At the skeleton... I know the bone is fascia that's got calcium in it, but the femur is a lever. Yeah. It's physics. And both things, I love it when both people can be right. Yes. And I agree. You can have this beautiful articulate web and Yanda, if you've taken like corrective exercise in the past, upper cross syndrome and lower, he was onto something there for sure. Muscles are inhibited. Muscles are adaptively shortened. not muscles connective tissue is adaptively shortened certain Mm -hmm. tissue is adaptively inhibited we know that like you said the two can coexist but i know that the patella is there to help the lever system for knee extension and we were talking about ACLs, for instance, and rehab, and there's this prevalent, there's this huge prevalence of ACL ruptures right now in the teenage population. And I was reading papers last week about why, and there was an interesting paper that said it has nothing to do with the, the valgus or the varus or the pelvis or the genu valgus. It, no, it has everything to do with all the artificial turf that everybody is playing on. And I was like, huh. Because the whole mechanism of an ACL rupture is the lower leg doesn't move and the femur moves and there's torque. And John Stott means there's actually no torque in the human body. And I'm like, but how are the ACLs rupturing? (laughs) There's no torque in the human body. Okay, that's a whole other podcast. It's 
it was so interesting to hear his side and he is so passionate about it. And that's just. Oh, and he's such an anatomist. In a perfect world, I want a USB port back here and I want John Sharkey's brain. I want Roger Billica's brain. Yes. Neil Rapin, Jay Shaw, you all right there. Of course, there's torque. How can the acceleration, deceleration, you can't not have physics. You can't not have physics. Just because it's biological tissue, you still have to have physics. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm not shooting anybody. What was your grade in college physics? Talk to me. <laughs> I love Talk physics to because it made sense to me. And I didn't like math, but I loved physics because it was something yeah. I could see in my head. Yeah. It's yeah. like the verbal physics. That makes sense. When you have to turn it into mathematics, it was painful. I agree. But there we go. How exciting. That was pretty cool. So I'll let everybody know when that's up. So Debbie's question came up. So let's get to that before we run out of time. Oh, uh, Debbie, talks I have to find my glasses. It's a really long question. Yeah. About a client in a wheelchair, her anxiety causes this the long story. I have to chat with you about it someday because everything she has serious problem goes into paralysis. This week, it's her voice because of a situation she can't cope with. Two sessions, I have brought her voice back. I have so much confidence in FSM. I treat 15, 20 clients a week. I was taught by the oh. Sharky. I'm just sitting here tonight. Thankful you guys are teaching me so much about FSM. Really? Incredibly emotional time when you have something that can help so many people. Yes. For yeah. sure. Yes. True story. And when you understand that the anxiety and the vocal cords are connected by the vagus nerve. Oh, yeah. The vagus controls every muscle in the vocal cords except for the one that lets you scream. So when you lose your voice, you look at what turned off the vagus nerve, infection, stress, and trauma. And then you follow that trail. Now you still have to treat the end disruption. Sure, yeah. You still have to treat the vocal cords. You still have to show the patient how to breathe get their diaphragm to work to send the air through the vocal cords so they work now the vocal cords are not spastic yeah and then what else does the vagus nerve does it turns down or controls the immune system and yeah. immune modulated inflammation t cells and macrophages yeah it was just it's so fun okay let's see who else debbie Oh, tonight you had the amygdala. I'd stick with 89 to tell you the truth. And speaking of emotions, I've gotten to this place and I'm not sure I'm going to stay there, but I have begun to think of emotions as derivative. So when your midbrain, the amygdala, the hippocampus and the thalamus all get together and create this thing that you have learned to feel and express as anger and resentment. I'm a psychologist, so I can't help myself. Always be behind anger and resentment or fear, terror. And in Chinese medicine, it's the colon and the kidney. There's two different kinds of fear, but those four are related. So I can treat the emotions, but unless I turn down the upset in the limbic system that's causing the emotion mm. that we call anger, resentment, terror, and fear. What's the point? So you set up 40 and 89 in our world to quiet the limbic system. And I love the people that talk about the limbic system sizes they do. And it's like, how many days, hours, days, weeks does that take to work? 
How about 10 minutes? Okay. <laughs> and then, so you treat that and then you treat the emotions. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. Because we have a way of doing it. Right. Because we can. And I'm not saying like people can't do vagal tone breathing and all that stuff during mm -hmm. treatment. That's awesome. Absolutely. At the same time. Yeah. But let's help it out when we can. Because yes. we can. Because. Two minutes. I want to just share this quote that I found and it made me think. So I wrote it actually down in my journal and I can't remember who wow. wrote it. Okay. I'm ready. Faith makes a demand on courage. Whoa. Yeah, it sounds easy. And then like you chew it a little bit more. Faith makes a demand on courage. Yeah. So that scene in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Yes. That I talk about in the resonance effect. Yes. Where he, he has a picture of the knight stepping off the cliff into thin air. Yeah. And the bridge doesn't appear until you land on it. Yeah. So faith is looking at the picture and there's Harrison Ford putting his hand over his chest, closing his eyes going, yeah, I have faith. And he steps out and the courage it takes to step and believe that the bridge will appear. Yes. That is a way to live. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Isn't it? I love it. It's terrifying and wonderful at the same time. Yes. It's both coexisting together. Integrity and mechanics. <laughs> and lever arms and courage. All of it. Okay. That's it for today. Very good. Do you think we have a title for this podcast? Since we're not using linear. Nothing is linear. <laughs> Kevin says something about. You know, she mentioned that it was going to be something linear, but it can't be that. Yeah. Something. No, be. So we're definitely not. I, at one of these days, it, the title is going to be Because We Can. I love it. Let, next week. Because We Can. Today, every day. Why do we do 124 and 77? Why does her thumb end up here instead of there? Because we can. Because we can. Yeah. And we have to know because it's true. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you. Bye, we'll sweetie. See you next week. Thank you. See you next week. Bye. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinion provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast. changer. They physics. Talk to <laughs>